it's great to see how much the World Social Marketing Conference has grown and exciting to see it uh, in, in our backyard for the first time. Um, as Doug said, my name is Jeff Jordan. I'm from Rescue, uh, the behavior change uh, agency. Um, and we focus exclusively on positive behavior change. We've been doing this work for over 16 years. It was high school, I promise, not, not elementary school when, when Rescue started. Um, and we've had the fortunate uh, uh, pleasure of working with so many unique clients that have really taken risks with us to help us grow um, and, and help us cause more behavior change around the country. Um, and now internationally, as we started working in, in places like Canada uh, and New Zealand. Um, and our focus is really to take a science-driven approach to change. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is some of that research that we do and how it informs um, our work and how it could inform your work um, uh, around the world. So uh, I often hear uh, a line like this in, in many different ways. We want to be as well known as Pepsi or Coke or McDonald's or Apple, or throw in whatever massive billion dollar brand you want to, and you will hear some local community health official telling you that's how big they want to be. Um, and the thing about this is that it's, it's a little bit of a misnomer. It's like, yeah, everyone knows what Pepsi is, everyone knows what Coke and Apple is, but not everyone actually does what those brands want them to do. And so there's this confusion in social change and in social marketing that just because someone knows that your brand exists um, and knows what your logo looks like, that you, in fact, are influencing them. When, in fact, a lot of people know Pepsi because they hate it. And a lot of people know Apple because they hate iPhones, right? And so really, we shouldn't really be comparing ourselves to these individual brands. We should be comparing ourselves to some of these corporations. Because these corporations are giving us a roadmap to understand how to reach entire populations of people and motivate them all to do what it is that we hope that they will do. So for example, here at PepsiCo, this um, massive company um, doesn't just sell Pepsi drinks. They also sell um, Mountain Dew and, and uh, Naked Juice and Sobe Teas. And they sell these brands that really seemingly have nothing to do with each other, right? Um, I mean, Naked Juice and Pepsi are pretty much at opposite ends of the health spectrum, um, but they both come from the same company. And so what does that tell us? Is it says none of these brands are actually trying to reach everybody. They're trying to be the right thing for a certain group of people so that that group of people um, adopts the product and, 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 and gives them their money. <laughs> and so for us, it's like, well, can we create, if, if, if these brands, um, if so many different brands are required for these huge companies, well then don't we also need a number of different brands to reach our audiences? Um, switching industries, looking at tobacco, it's the same situation. You have huge corporations that have individual brands to reach different groups of people because they know that none of these brands would reach all of the, um, all of the people that they're trying to reach. They all understand that who you are motivates behavior more powerfully than what you know. And so what they do is they build brands for people. They say, yes, it's the exact same product, right? A little stick of tobacco covered in, in paper that gives you cancer, but I'm going to sell it with different brands so that different people get cancer from it, right? <laughs> and they understand it's all about the people, not about the thing that you're trying to talk about. So, so what does that mean for us? Well, we have to kind of come to the conclusion and realization that there has never been a commercial brand, not Nike, not Apple, not Coke, that appeals to everyone. So why do we continue to try and make one public health brand, one social brand, uh, to reach everyone, right? Apple can't do it with a billion dollars, but my $50,000 is going to reach everybody in my community. And they're all going to stop, you know, start exercising and stop smoking and everything because of my one brand. It's just not realistic. And the commercial world has shown us it's just not possible. There is no such thing anywhere in the world that exists that is a brand that appeals to everyone. So what do we do? Well, we have to start to act more like them. We have to start to segment and understand exactly who it is that we're trying to reach. Unfortunately, right now, for, uh, for those of us that work in public health, we know that public health tends to make brands for, for topics, for issues. For example, let's talk about obesity prevention. And let's say that you are the average Joe in a community um, that, is, that needs to exercise, needs to kind of eat better. And the public health you know, group there in your state, in your country, is trying to reach you. So how will they reach you? Well, you'll probably get a message about eating healthy from someone. 
And you'll be like, okay, great, that, that seems you know, good enough. I'll start to think about that. But before you can take action, there's someone else telling you, oh, well, make sure to go to the farmer's market. Different brand, different campaign. Okay, the farmer's market, maybe it'll help me with the eat healthy thing. Oh, but wait, oh, but also here's a new campaign and it's telling you to exercise. So you gotta do that one too. And then now there's another campaign that's saying actually cook in your house more because that'll make you healthier. Okay, all right, these four brands, I'm, I'm kind of juggling these messages now. And there's another brand. Now it's like, hey, school lunch is actually the answer. And you have to start advocating for better school lunches. It's like, all right, what was the first message again? Oh wait, there's another one, drink more water. And now we have a new water campaign that has its own logo and its own brand and its own strategy. And wait, there's more. Now we have shop better. Make sure to look at the nutrition labels when you go to the grocery store to help you with the other seven brands that we just told you about. And wait, don't forget, to plant a vegetable garden at your house. And we have the new garden brand telling you to do that. So we have a single person right, who doesn't, probably doesn't have a lot of time, doesn't have a lot of resources, could care less about what it is that you're trying to make them do, and we have just put the entire burden of reconciling these messages and figuring out where they, where they fit into their life on them. We said, no, we're not gonna worry about putting this together, we're just gonna shoot everything at you in the most disparate, completely disconnected way possible, just for fun, you know, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, right? <laughs> you like jigsaw puzzles? It doesn't work. It doesn't work because these aren't issues, these are people. These are people that we're trying to change and people who have lifestyles, who have specific ways that they can and cannot incorporate change into their life. And as social marketers, it's our job to figure out where can change fit in their lives and explain to them, here's the things that we think someone in your situation can do and here's how we think those things can fit into your life. Take a few more steps in their direction. Now, we often say, you know, well, we want to compete with McDonald's, or we want to compete with these huge companies that are, you know, for the most part, promoting unhealthy uh, behaviors, although their grilled chicken salad is great. Um, I do have it occasionally. Um, but, but we say, all right, we're, we're going to compete with them, right? So let's, let's take a journey real quick, and let's pretend that McDonald's operated like us, okay? And let's see what that looks like. So corporate says... Get people to buy more salads, all right? So what does it do? Well, first of all, um, you know, it decides it wants people to buy more salads. It tells the franchisees to each create their own brands to increase salad sales amongst two key demographics, Hispanics and low-income Caucasians. Um, because obviously every community is different, and so everyone needs a different brand. Um, so now, corporate gives each franchise funds to do their own research and develop their own salad campaign. The franchisees spend six months planning their strategies, including posters, upselling, new salads, price discounts, and community outreach. Corporate tells each franchisee to make sure to evaluate. So survey the people that you're talking to and ask them if they're now more likely to buy salads because of your campaign. And one year later, corporate decides it wants to sell apple wedges instead of salads, and the salad program has ended. <laughs> right? What company would survive under these circumstances? None. None. For McDonald's, you know, I, I hear people tell me all the time, well, my community is different. You got to do it differently. And I say, well, do you have a McDonald's? Well, I bet your McDonald's is exactly the same as my McDonald's, and they both seem to be thriving. So our communities are more similar than you think, right? So we have to start to kind of look at how can we be more efficient and more targeted with the kind of change that we're putting out there? And we need to build brands for people, not topics, because it's people that we're trying to change. So what does that mean? Well, we gotta start with segmentation, because segmentation is the first step to understanding our audiences more effectively. Uh, officially, it's defined as the process of classifying a market into distinct segments that behave in similar ways or have similar uh, needs. And so we have to say, all right, let's put what we want to do aside, right? And let's start to look at our audience and say, well, what do they want? What do they care about? What are their values? What's their lifestyle like? What's their day like? And start to group them based on their similarities so that we can help them understand how our behavior can fit into their lives. Now, let me show you a quick example of segmentation from, from some of our work. Uh, for teenagers, we like to segment using something called peer crowds. And peer crowds is an evidence-based segment, segmentation approach that exists in the literature, and it's defined as the macro-level connections between peer groups with similar interests, lifestyles, influencers, and habits. And so while a teen kind of has their peer group that they belong to, 
both the teen and the peer group belong to this macro level peer crowd that share similarities across geographic areas. So what do these peer crowds look like? Well, we've done this research all across the country. We started doing this research, uh, as I mentioned before, in Canada and New Zealand, and have found tremendous similarities across geographic areas. No two communities are alike, but what we find is that each of these peer crowds is defined the same way no matter where you are, even if one is very small in one city and very large in another. So the most common peer crowds we've found are these five. Uh, mainstream teens, which are kind of the middle of the road teens that every parent wishes they had. Um, they, they have some sort of interest other than their social status, like, their, like clubs, school, video games, sports, or whatever it is, and that drives them, so they tend to be very low risk. We have preppy popular teens, which are the quintessential American teenager. They listen to top 40 music. They're football players and cheerleaders, and they dress cool and try to be social, and they take lots of selfies and Snapchats and things like that. Um, then we have the alternative group, and alternative are kind of the counterculture teens. They don't want to be anything like the popular teens, so they'll dye their hair, pierce, uh, get piercings, um, and really show that they are very different than, than the norm. Country teens are our traditionalists. Um, they love to kind of be outdoors, go hunting, go mudding, do things that are um, very traditionally American, um, and they really like to be patriotic. And finally, we have hip-hop teens, which are all, uh, a multicultural group that's all about um, overcoming the struggle and showing that they are strong, that they can overcome all these obstacles that have been thrown in their way. And so what we've found through doing this research is that it's not just fun, like, oh, great, look at those fun descriptions of teenagers. These are real distinctions between these teens that actually are associated with risk behaviors. So what we were able to do um, is we've been able to actually put uh, photos that represent each of these groups into a survey to measure um, how different these, uh, the behaviors of these teens are. And we've had that survey added to, Virgi uh, to Virginia's, uh, the state we're in, um, Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And so, pretty shocking, because you're, normally you're not allowed to add anything to that, but, um, but Virginia stood firm and said, this is important to us. We don't want to know just, um, you know, how many people are doing these risk behaviors. We want to know who they are and what their culture is. And so we got the YRBS added, in 2000, added to the YRBS in 2015. Over 5,000 high school students took what we call the IBASE survey, which measures your peer crowd influence. Um, and we found um, incredible, incredible things about teens in Virginia. First of all, we saw that the biggest group was preppy, uh, which was uh, the preppy popular group, which was to be expected. About 35% of teens primarily were influenced by this group. And then we're also able to measure secondary influences, and about 75% of teens had some sort of influence from the preppy uh, culture. Um, and we also had about 20% in mainstream, 15% in hip hop, 7.5% in country, and 58 in alternative. Um, but what was more interesting was their risk behaviors. So I'm only going to show you a few. Um, first, tobacco use. We found that hip-hop teens and alternative teens are significantly more likely to use tobacco use, um, almost uh, more than 50% more likely than the average, uh, compared to mainstream teens that are uh, less than 50% likely to, uh, to use tobacco use. And when you look at individual tobacco behaviors, it's actually different products. The alternative teens are using cigarettes, the hip-hop teens are smoking cigarillos, and the country teens, which are also at elevated risk, are chewing tobacco. Uh, when we look at marijuana, it's hip-hop teens that by far are most likely to have used marijuana in the past 30 days, 34% compared to just 15.8% uh, in the state, so more than double the risk. Um, similarly, for taking a prescription drug without a doctor's uh, per a prescription, it's hip-hop teens uh, that were also at about two times the risk of, of the state average, with elevated risk for alternative teens as well. And again, you're seeing these mainstream teens, you know, parents aim for mainstream, they continue to be at lowest risk for all these behaviors. <laughs> uh, drinking soda every day. It was the country teens that have drank soda every day. Uh, there's actually this thing called uh, Dew Mouth that exists in our rural areas where parents feed their babies Mountain Dew and then they like their teeth don't develop properly um, uh, because obviously that was a good idea. Um, and uh, binge drinking. It was uh, the hip hop culture that was most at risk of, of uh, binge drinking in the past 30 days, about 50% more than the average, and elevated risk for alternative and, and preppy teens. So you see that these peer crowds are totally different from each other, um, with different risk behaviors, and that if we didn't actually pick one of them, well, we wouldn't be able to reach them, right? If we're saying we're just going to reach teens, does that mean that the hip-hop teens are actually going to look at our message and say it's for them, or that the country teens are going to listen to us, or that the alternative teens are going to listen to us? Probably not. When we say we're just going to reach teens, guess which group we probably end up reaching? 
the mainstream teens, right? Because they're the most nondescript ones in the, in the center of culture that don't really care about all these things. And so to cause change, we have to look at who these people are. And more importantly, we have to say, well, wait a minute. If we're making brands for people and not topics, shouldn't we maybe be talking about some of these issues that affect the exact same group of people together? For example, the, the hip hop peer crowd is at significantly higher risk of e-cigarettes, cigarillos, hookah, prescription drugs, binge drinking, um, using ecstasy, cocaine, or heroin, marijuana, over-the-counter drugs, and low physical activity. While the alternative peer crowd is at significantly higher risk of cigarettes, um, using ecstasy, cocaine, or heroin, over-the-counter drugs, low physical activity, suicide, depression, etc. So if we know that there's this group of young people that are afflicted by these multiple behaviors, why don't we start to make brands that are truly meaningful to their culture and help, them, uh, and help address some of the underlying issues that are causing all of these high-risk behaviors rather than saying, well, each of these behaviors is a separate, separate line item on my budget. And that is this data, that is what it's driving in Virginia with conversations happening at the, at the, state, at the highest at the state level finally about should we be talking about multiple issues together and focus more on a people-centric approach rather than a topic-centric approach. So what does that look like? What does change look like? Well, um, let me show you an example. So we, uh, the strategy we use to cause change is called social branding. And it's a behavior change marketing strategy that utilizes peer crowd targeted brands to associate healthy behaviors with peer crowd values. The goal is to introduce a brand that can compete with the current role models and introduce the new behavior into the high risk culture that we're trying to reach. And so what does that look like? Um, well, you first have to realize that you don't have to convince them to agree with you to convince them to change. What that means is that you may have reasons why you think people should change, but someone doesn't have to agree with those reasons in order to actually change their behaviors. They can change for their own reasons. In fact, if you ever want to be in a world where nobody engages in a specific risk behavior, you're going to need to have multiple reasons for people not to engage in that risk behavior because people are different. So take, take this for example. Let's say that we are promoting exercise and your reason to promote exercise is because people will live longer and, and have less diseases if they are physically active, right? So that's what we promote. But what if there's a whole group of people that want to exercise because they want to look great naked? <laughs> are we not okay with that? Can we not tell them like, hey, uh, idea, you will look better naked if you exercise. <laughs> and then they change their behavior. If at the end of the day their behavior changes, do we care what the reason was that they changed? No. But unfortunately, we get too caught up in the reasons that, of why our funder gave us the money to begin with. And we say, well, we have to tell them the scientific reason that they need to change because that's the right answer. Well, it may not be the right answer for them. So don't force them to agree with you. Open yourself up to what their values are and, and what, how change can fit into their life. We have to find a value and associate that value with the targeted behavior that we're trying to change. So let me show you a quick example uh, from here in Virginia. So what has this data caused? Uh, we've been doing peer crowd segmented work in Virginia for, uh, for almost 10 years now. Um, and Virginia, despite being the home of Philip Morris, despite being a tobacco growing state, uh, has a significantly lower teen tobacco use rate than the, than the average in the US, right? So imagine that, right in Philip Morris's backyard, we are innovating in um, how to cause uh, tobacco behavior change. And here's an example of what it looks like. They have three different brands that they currently promote for each of the, the high-risk crowds, Psych for alternative teens, Down and Dirty for country teens, and they currently work with uh, our other client, the FDA, on, on amplifying the Fresh Empire campaign here locally, which targets hip-hop teens. And this is what they look like. Here's Down and Dirty. Some people call this a hack. We just call it fixed. Need a shower? Got one. Hungry at a barbecue? Grab a rake. Always dreamt of a pool? Grab a tarp. Yeah, there's a quick fix to just about anything. But there ain't no fix for dip. Why? Because that dipping and chewing leads to losing your teeth and gum disease. And there ain't no quick fix to a broke down smile. And that's why I live tobacco free. So by targeting country teens, we were able to tap into a specific value and a specific trend within country culture, which they called um, redneck hacks. And so we found this trend online. Uh, it was, you know, they would fix anything and everything with duct tape. For those of you that are here from abroad, that's what we call American ingenuity. 
Um, and, and they use that uh, as a source of pride. And so we said, well, let's tap into that. Let's celebrate their culture and let's show how the effects of tobacco can't be quickly fixed by duct tape. Um, and, and for the most part, it's done great, except we have had one focus group where a kid said, well, you can roll up paper and put it where your tooth was. And so they're, they're thinking, but you know, if they try it, they'd realize it, it wouldn't work. Um, so that's country teens, and here's what our alternative effort looks like. To describe our band's sound, I have to say melodic metal. If you're touring right and if you're treating your body right, it's awesome. It's a, not only a mental game, but it's a physical game too. I smoked cigarettes for five years and I quit. I've never felt better in my entire life. Secondhand smoke honestly just dampers the entire room's energy. The so scent, the bad awesome. breath, the yellow teeth. Smoking just isn't our thing. It's not our style and it never will be. So here you see a very different approach, an influencer-driven approach for a culture that is, that is very skeptical of outside voices. So every single psych ad that we've ever made has featured a prominent band who doesn't smoke and is willing to share that because this is an alternative specific effort. If we were creating a general teen campaign to target everybody, these, brand, these bands wouldn't be comfortable associating themselves with it. But they're comfortable with psych because psych is about a smoke-free scene. It's about the alternative rock culture by and for the culture itself. And finally, here's an example of the, um, of the Fresh Empire campaign, which uh, Virginia is amplifying locally to reach hip hop teens. If he is you, if you are her, Keep your life, your voice, tobacco free. Speak up and be heard. Keep it fresh, live tobacco free. And so here you see a very empowerment driven message, um, something that motivates hip hop teens in particular because all they hear all day is why they shouldn't do something and that they're gonna get in trouble by this and that this is bad or that's bad. And so showing them a, a positive path forward is something that particularly for this peer crowd is highly motivating. And so um, these brands, what we're seeing is uh, effectiveness across communities for different, um, different age groups, including teens and young adults. And we attribute that success to the targeting, to the fact that we know exactly who the audience is and can really tailor messages to those audiences. We're not trying to reach everybody with the exact same message. And we're even open to having multiple brands in one community that are targeting different groups of people. Again, a people-oriented approach rather than a um, topic-oriented approach. Um, and in addition, they're shared. And so what that means is that a brand like Down and Dirty is being implemented in five different states by five different clients. Why? Because McDonald's is implemented globally. If every single one of us makes a brand new campaign and a brand new brand for every single thing that we're trying to talk about, we're never going to build the brand equity and the awareness and the assets that the commercial world has to promote some of these unhealthy behaviors. We have to start to think differently about can we work together more and start to build these kind of public health social marketing assets that can start to at least a little bit compete with some of these brands um, that exist in the commercial world. And so be a change agent, redefine a behavior. Look at a behavior and say, okay, everyone associates that with being healthy or being environmentally friendly or whatever it is. How can I associate it with the opposite group? How can I make someone who hates Greenpeace want to protect the environment? How can I make someone who is completely rebellious want to not get cancer from smoking? And that's the question that us as social marketers have to answer. We have to take on the burden of showing our communities where the behavior we're promoting fits in their unique life, rather than letting them try and figure that out. And so in closing, I'll leave you with a few parting thoughts. The first thing we have to do, you know, for these kind of troubled times, we have to unite. We have to unite and we have to work together more and find opportunities to share resources because shared resources will make our dollars go further and will help us start to build bigger brands and longer lasting brands. We can't have all of these pop up and go away efforts because we'll never have those assets. We also have to stand up. 
We have to stand up against funders that want to be different just for the sake of being different and say, hey, we've got to build on what's already out there. That's, that's something that we've focused on for, for many years, and we have all of our clients talking and working with each other uh, because there's an opportunity there to share resources, and that's something that should be happening across the board. And finally, we have to resist the temptation not to segment your audience because that is something that will really hinder every single one of our campaigns. So with that, thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. <laughs>